now at 11. An avalanche buries skiers in Idaho. Tonight, local rescuers show us the survival tools that could save your life if you're ever trapped in the snow. Plus, police officers jump in to save a Newburgh family struggling to escape their burning home. And it was pretty high up and I was thinking, man, she's gonna have to drop her kids. How they got creative to make sure everyone got out safely. And later, extremely high tides on the Oregon coast this weekend could give us a glimpse into the future. We begin tonight with two major stories from Iran, a missile attack on U.S. forces, and on top of that, a commercial airliner has crashed, killing everyone on board. First tonight, the missile strike. Iran has claimed responsibility for firing ballistic missiles that hit two military bases in Iraq that host U.S. troops. There were no immediate reports of American casualties. Tonight, the president and lawmakers are reacting to the attack. Alice Barr has the latest for us from Washington, D.C. Tonight, dramatic new video aired on Iranian state TV appears to show the moment of attack on two Iraqi military bases that house American troops. The Pentagon confirming Iran launched more than a dozen ballistic missiles at those facilities, Iran calling it retribution for the killing of its top general, Qasem Soleimani. But this is undoubtedly the most serious moment between Iran and America in the last 40 years. Tonight, President Trump downplaying the attacks, tweeting all is well and so far so good on the assessment of casualties. Tremendous Earlier today, he issued a stern warning. If Iran does anything that they shouldn't be doing, they're going to be suffering the consequences and very strongly. And with Iran already threatening more retaliation, lawmakers are raising alarm about where we go from here. I am questioning whether or not the Trump administration has a coherent strategy for what to do next. Republican Senator Rand Paul tracing the tensions back to the U.S. pulling out of the Iran nuclear deal. I think this maximum pressure campaign where we give no off ramp and there's no ability or attempt to engage, I think it's been a failure. While supporters say the president was right to fight back. Appeasement hasn't worked. Weakness invites the wolves. President Trump earlier defending his decision to kill Soleimani based on intelligence he was planning imminent attacks on Americans. And he was a monster. And he's no longer a monster. He's dead. Tonight, the U.S. and Iran both on high alert, each side waiting to see what the other will do next. If the U.S. retaliates, Iran is threatening counterstrikes against Israel and the United Arab Emirates. In Washington, Alice Barr, NBC News. Oregon Senator Ron Wyden is making a strong statement tonight in response to the attack. He said, quote, Iran's attack on U.S. soldiers and our allies was contemptible. But Donald Trump must not further escalate this volatile situation or use military force against Iran without approval from Congress. His reckless actions and rhetoric have already increased threats to American troops. He goes on to say, I opposed a disastrous war in the Middle East in 2003, and I sure as hell won't stand by while Trump drags us into another war that weakens our country, unquote. Look for continuing coverage of the attack on KGW News at Sunrise with live reports following on the Today Show. The president is also expected to make an official statement tomorrow. And we're following breaking news from Iran of a commercial plane crash. Emergency officials say all 176 passengers and crew on board were killed. There's no indication this is in any way related to the military conflict. The Ukrainian airliner had just taken off from an airport in Tehran when it crashed in farmland outside of the city. Iranian state-run media reports the crash was due to technical difficulties. This was a Boeing 737 plane that's different from the 737 MAX that was involved in two crashes last year. Closer to home, an avalanche at a resort in Idaho killed two people and injured several others. It got us wondering, what is the avalanche forecast on Mount Hood? And is there anything you can do to protect yourself? KGW's Mike Benner joins us with more on this, Mike. Well, Laurel, just an awful situation in Idaho. This all unfolded at this Silver Mountain Resort. The exact area of the avalanche is unclear, but we know there was an avalanche warning in the backcountry there. That is typically where you'll see avalanches. The good news is there are some things you can do to keep safe in those less traversed areas. Silver Mountain in northwest Idaho, the scene of a deadly avalanche early Tuesday. 
KGW has learned five people were injured, two were killed. A lot of times you're going to die from trauma because they're very violent. Eric Brahms of Portland Mountain Rescue is saddened, but not surprised to hear that an avalanche claimed lives. It's not like, you know, the snow is going to just gently take you down the hill. You're going down a hill or down, you know, some terrain at a high rate of speed. We've seen it before on Mount Hood. In fact, right now, the avalanche danger there is high above the tree line and considerable near and below it. Look at the avalanche forecast. Stay out of avalanche terrain. Brum says your chances of surviving an avalanche are higher if you and your skiing or climbing partners are carrying the right tools. <laughs> Starting with an avalanche beacon. It sends out a signal that is picked up on here. This device will uh, direct you to where that signal is. Once there, Brahms says, you'll need a probe to explore the snow and, of course, a shovel. Depending on the snow depth and angle, you either dig downhill or straight down. Um, Tips worth heeding in the wake of a deadly avalanche in neighboring Idaho. Now, rescue crews were searching for people late into this evening. Those search efforts, though, have wrapped up. It appears everyone is now accounted for. Dan. All right, Matt. All right. Uh, thank you. Appreciate that. We'll go to Matt now, Chief Meteorologist Matt Zafino. Uh, the Cascades will be seeing a lot of snow this week, Matt. Yeah, and we typically see our most active avalanche cycles in the Cascades and the exact kind of conditions that are coming our way during or within 24 hours of a heavy snowfall for the Cascades. It's different for the Continental Mountains like Silver Star as you go farther inland. Different things happen in the snowpack there, but for us it's usually, not always, but usually during or right after a big snowfall. We got some big snowfall on the way, so be careful. It, it's really going to be not great travel in the backcountry, especially as we go into the weekend. All right, right now things are cooling off. This is government at camp. It's down to 32.7 and the road is now snow covered once again there. Look at Santa Ana Pass down into the 20s. Road totally snow covered and Willamette Pass showing the snow falling heavily at Willamette Pass. So it's been come down the road about an inch an hour. They've already picked up four inches of new snow tonight up at Timberline and it will keep snowing overnight tonight. Look at this snowfall forecast for Mount Hood. Every single day almost except for Thursday, we're running into double digit snowfall here. So if you add this all up through the next week and look at Sunday, 10 to 20 inches, that's at least 38 inches as much as 74 inches in the next week. So that's what I'm talking about. Heavy snowfall coming our way. We will see an avalanche cycle in the Cascades as well and travel on the roads is going to be treacherous this weekend with all that heavy snow. The plows will have a hard time keeping up. Another way of looking at this, look at the map, all the ski areas in the northwest, 60, 70 inches. Again, this is through next Tuesday, but it is very, very impressive. So the headlines shake out like this. Snow will stay below the passes now. Their snow level won't be going back up above the passes for at least a week. In fact, probably a lot longer. And our snow pack right now is about 40% of average on Mount Hood. It's been a fairly light year so far. By next week, we'll probably be above average and it's going to get very cold too and the heaviest snow again over the weekend. Now there's more with the stormy weather too, including some coastal issues that we got to talk about. I'll have that later. Back to you. Thank you, Matt. And some more weather developments to tell you about. Spots near Seattle tonight are dealing with flooding and landslides like the one you're looking at here. A different slide is blocking Amtrak trains right now. Passengers cannot get from Portland to Seattle on the train until at least Thursday morning. Shuttle buses are making the trip instead. Meanwhile, flood warnings have been issued for several rivers. New aerial footage shows several flooded fields in King County. Now to Newburgh in a harrowing rescue, a family trapped in a burning second story apartment. Catherine Cook talked with the police officers who figured out a way to save them. You try to do your best to to be successful. It's an attitude I, officers Paul Repé. He's a guy I would call. And Jeremy Pilon. He's a good uh, good person, he's a great officer. Wear every day under their Newburgh Dundee police uniforms. That was especially true Tuesday morning. Around 1.30 a.m., dispatch reported a fire on South River Road in Newburgh. A baseboard heater had caught a Christmas tree on fire in the second floor apartment. We showed up, saw the black smoke, knew that it didn't look good. I looked up and the whole family was kind of hanging out the window looking for um, fresh air. A mom and her two daughters were trapped. Kicked the door in thinking maybe we'd be able to go in and it was too, 
too smoky. So it was back to the window and a tough call. It was pretty high up and I was thinking, man, she's going to have to drop her kids. Mom lowered each of her daughters down to Officer Pilon. I could tell that the girl was really scared and I, um, I just sat there and talked to her. I was like, I'm going to catch you. Trust me, I'm going to catch you. The officers couldn't catch the mom and the window was far too high for her to jump from. They needed a ladder, but with firefighters still on their way, they had to think outside the box and fast. So I thought best course of action would be to drive a car right next to the house. Officer Pilon's Ford Explorer gave them a six foot scaffolding under the window. Get a little bit more height uh, to get the, the mom out. Officer Rappe and Officer Brad Dickerson climbed on the roof and together caught mom. Neither one of them fell down and that was great. Nobody got hurt. I think there was a small dent in it, but um, that's a that's a price worth paying. The mom, who didn't want to be identified, tells KGW she and her daughters are alive because of these officers. Oh, she's very thankful. It's hard to say how much time it could have had. It, we just did what we did as fast as we could. Tualatin Valley Fire and Rescue put out the fire, and the Red Cross helped the family get housing. Officers Rappe and Pilon clocked out. I'm proud of what I do, proud of my, my co co-workers. In Newburgh. I know this is where I'm supposed to be. Catherine Cook. I love these guys. KGW News. Wow, we're proud of them too. That was quite a rescue. New information tonight on the crash that killed an 11 year old boy in Gresham. The driver accused of hitting him appeared in court today. Police say Garrett Bergquist was impaired by medication and shouldn't have been driving. He is now charged with manslaughter and DUII. We also learned the name of the young victim today. He was Luis Javier Medina. Investigators say he was in the crosswalk with the right of way when Bergquist ran a red light and hit him. Nobody wakes up in the morning thinking that they're going to bury their child that day. And that's just heartbreaking. That was Luis's cousin who was leaving flowers at the site where he was killed today. The family has started a GoFundMe to try to cover funeral costs. We have an important update for you now to a story we first brought you last March. A Sherwood piano teacher charged with sexually abusing a child was acquitted on all charges last month. Christopher Griffin was accused of abusing an eight year old female student at Let's Make Music and Dance Academy. A Washington County judge found him not guilty and released him from custody.